All right, let's get right into it. Your assigned problems may or may not have different randomized values. For best results, attempt the assignment on your own before watching these solutions. Students are encouraged to frequently pause the video to work out steps on their own before proceeding with the solutions. And here's the list of topics to be covered in this video. So for problem one, we're going to consider the algebraic expression 16 minus 2x cubed. First, we're asked, what's the degree of this polynomial? Now, the degree of a polynomial is its highest power, and we see x cubed. The highest power is 3. It is of degree 3. What's the constant term? In other words, what is a term that has no variable in it? That's the 16. What is the leading coefficient? That's the coefficient on the largest power of the variable. Our largest power was x cubed, and it's being multiplied by negative 2. What's the leading term? That is the highest power of the variable with its coefficient, so the negative 2 with the x cubed, negative 2x cubed. For problem 2, find the degree, leading coefficient, and constant term of the polynomial. f of x equals negative 3x to the 5th plus 5x to the 8th minus 4x to the 9th minus 5. Now the degree is the largest power of the variable, and we see an x to the 9th, it is of degree 9. What's the leading coefficient? That's the coefficient on that largest power. A negative 4 times x to the 9th, so the leading coefficient is negative 4. What's the constant term? What's the term without a variable? It's a minus 5. Problem 3. Given the function p of n is n minus 4 times n plus 1 times n minus 5, what are the coordinates of its p-intercept? So for the p-intercept, we set the domain variable n to be 0, and we compute 0 minus 4 times 0 plus 1 times 0 minus 5, or negative 4 times 1 times negative 5 for 20. So the coordinates are 0, 20. What about the coordinates of its n-intercepts? So now we're going to set p equal to 0. So 0 is equal to n minus 4 times n plus 1 times n minus 5. We have a product of three parenthetical terms. Now this product can be 0 if and only if one of the terms is 0. In other words, either n minus 4 is 0, or possibly n plus 1 is 0, or possibly n minus 5 is 0. In other words, n could be 4, or minus 1, or 5. So in terms of coordinates, we can plug in a 4 and get out a 0 for the uh, coordinate pair 4, 0, or we can plug in a negative 1 and get out 0 for the coordinate pair negative 1, 0, or we can plug in a 5 and get out 0 for the coordinate pair 5, 0. In problem 4, we have the graph of a polynomial, and we want to write an expression in factored form that could represent this. So we find some roots. We have roots at x equals negative 3, negative 2, positive 2, and positive 3. Therefore, the function has factors x plus 3, x plus 2, x minus 2, and x minus 3. In that order, the root of minus 3 gives us a factor x plus 3, because plugging in x equals minus 3 into the term x plus 3 would produce a 0. So the roots in order, negative 3, negative 2, positive 2, positive 3, produce the factors in order x plus 3, x plus 2, x minus 2, x minus 3. The power on each of these factors is going to be the multiplicity of the root. When the multiplicity is odd, the graph crosses the axis at that point. And we're going to aim for least degree just to be simple. So we have four roots. The graph does cross, so we need odd multiplicity. So we're just going to use the first power. So f of x is going to be something times x plus 3 to the first, x plus 2 to the first, x minus 2 to the first, x minus 3 to the first. Q of x is an unknown polynomial, but we factored out what we know has to be there. If we're still aiming for the lowest possible degree, we're going to say q should be the smallest degree possible, in other words, degree 0, so q should be a constant. So f of x is going to be some constant times x plus 3, x plus 2, x minus 2, x plus 3. So, so far we've determined that f of x should be of the form a constant times x plus 3 times x plus 2 times x minus 2 times x minus 3. To find what that constant should be, we're going to use the intercept that we can spot on the graph of 0, negative 3. There it is on the graph. It has pretty clear coordinates. So if we replace x with 0, f of x should be minus 3. In other words, minus 3 is equal to an unknown constant a times the quantity 0 plus 3, times the quantity 0 plus 2, times the quantity 0 minus 2, times the quantity 0 minus 3. We multiply all those things together and we get negative 3 is equal to 36 times a. We can divide both sides by 36 and see that a is minus 1 twelfth. In other words, f of x equals negative 1 twelfth times x plus 3 times x plus 2 times x minus 2 times x minus 3 
is the polynomial of smallest degree that matches the roots we see and the intercept we see. Okay, very similar to the previous problem, we want to write an expression in factored firm, form for the polynomial whose graph is given here. So we're going to look for roots. We see roots at x at negative 2, negative 1, positive 1, and 3. So x plus 2, x plus 1, x minus 1, and x minus 3 are all factors. But what are the multiplicities on these factors? Crossing roots have odd multiplicity. We'll use the smallest we can, so multiplicity 1. Non-crossing roots have even multiplicity, and the smallest we can do there is 2. So f of x is an unknown polynomial q. Since the root at minus 2 had odd multiplicity because it is a crossing root, we have the factor x plus 2 to the first. Any odd uh, power would work, but we're going to stick with the positive odd power small as possible, so 1. Similarly, at the root of negative 1, we cross, so we have odd multiplicity. We'll use the smallest positive odd number we can, or 1. So we have x plus 1 to the first. We have a crossing root at positive 1, so we have a power of positive 1 on x minus 1. And observe at x equals 3, the graph doesn't cross, it merely touches the axis, so it has even multiplicity, so we're going to go with uh, multiplicity 2. So we have a factor x minus 3 squared. Overall, we want our answer to have the smallest possible degree, so again, we're going to assume that q of x is just some sort of constant. All right, so we've determined f of x is a constant, times x plus 2, times x plus 1, times x minus 1, times x minus 3 squared, and to determine the value of that constant, once again, we'll use the intercept. It doesn't appear to be a whole number, but it's pretty good to be at 9 halves, 4 and a half there. So we're going to say that if you plug in x equals 0, you should get out f of x equals 9 halves. So 9 halves equals a times the quantity 0 plus 2 times the quantity 0 plus 1 times the quantity 0 minus 1 times the quantity 0 minus 3 squared. This all simplifies down to say that 9 over 2 should be equal to negative 18 times a. If you divide both sides by negative 18, you get a is minus 1 fourth. So a pretty good choice for a polynomial that could produce this graph. It matches the roots and with correct multiplicities. It would be f of x equals minus 1 fourth times x plus 2 times x plus 1 times x minus 1 times x minus 3 squared. Problem 6. Describe the long run behavior of f of x equals 2 times x minus 5 times x minus 1 cubed times x minus 2 squared. Well, as x goes to infinity, what happens to f of x? And as x goes to minus infinity, what happens to f of x? That's long run behavior. Now, long run behavior for a polynomial is completely determined by the leading term. If the leading coefficient is positive or negative, that determines what happens as x goes to positive infinity. And if the degree is odd or even, tells you whether the two end behavior, the two long run directions, do the same thing or different things. So we don't need to expand the entire polynomial to find that. We're just going to be looking for the leading term. So x minus 5, x minus 1 cubed, x minus 2 squared, how do I get the leading term? I get the highest power of x, so every time I try to FOIL something out, I make the choice to multiply all the x's together that I can. We've got the 2 out in front, an x, an x cubed, an x squared. The leading term here will be 2, x to the 6th. The leading term has a positive coefficient. When the leading term of a polynomial uh, has a positive coefficient, in other words, when the leading coefficient is positive, as x goes to infinity, f of x goes to infinity. And the degree is even, and that tells us that the end behavior or long run behavior is the same in both directions. For an odd degree polynomial, it will do different things in different directions. Here we have an even degree, does the same thing in both directions. So since it went to infinity on the right, it also goes to infinity on the left. For problem seven, describe the long run behavior of this polynomial. As x goes to infinity or as x goes to minus infinity, what happens? And again, we really just need the leading term. So for all of the factors x minus 2, x plus 1, x minus 5, as you FOIL them out and you say, oh, I could choose to multiply the x or the 2 or the 5, whatever, always pick the x so that you get the highest power of x possible. So you end up with negative 3x to the 10th. There's the leading term of this polynomial. That's a negative leading coefficient, negative 3. So as x goes to infinity, f of x goes to minus infinity. And because the degree of this polynomial is even, it's of degree 10, it does the same thing in both directions. So since to the right it went to minus infinity, its degree is even, it does the same thing. To the left it goes to minus infinity.
For problem eight, we have a polynomial of degree five. It has leading coefficient one. It has a root of multiplicity two at x equals five and also x equals zero, and a root of multiplicity one at x equals minus five. Find a possible formula for p of x. Well, we have roots of multiplicity two at x equals five and zero. So we have factors x minus five squared and x minus zero squared. x equals minus five is a root of multiplicity one, so x plus five to the first will be a factor. Therefore, p of x has altogether factor x minus 5 squared, x squared, x plus 5. If you just multiplied these out, you would get a degree 5 term, x to the fifth. So p is known to be degree 5. That was given information. So there are no more factors of positive degree. So there's just a constant term times x minus 5 squared, x squared, x plus 5. If we were to expand this out, a would exactly be the leading coefficient, and in fact, we were told the leading coefficient is exactly 1. So we know exactly what this polynomial is. It's x minus 5 squared, x squared, x plus 5. It's not just a possible formula for p of x, it's all it could possibly do. For problem 9, we have a polynomial of degree 4. It has a root of multiplicity 2 at x equals 2, and roots of multiplicity 1 at x equals 0 and x equals minus 4. Also, we know it goes through the point 5, 243. We're asked to find a possible formula for p of x. Well, it has a root of multiplicity 2 at x equals 2, so the factor x minus 2 has exponent 2, because that's the multiplicity. x equals 0 and x equals minus 4 are roots of multiplicity 1, so the factors x minus 0 and x plus 4 are both raised to the first power. Altogether, then, we have x minus 2 squared, x, x plus 4 as one combined factor. That would generate an x to the fourth. We have x minus 2 squared, that gives us roughly an x squared, and x and x plus 4 is roughly an x. We already have x to the fourth just from these factors. p of x was given to be of degree 4, so there are no more factors of this polynomial that have positive degree. There might be an extra factor of zero degree, in other words, a constant. So p of x is a constant times x minus 2 squared times x times x plus 4. To determine the value of that constant, we'll simply plug in that when x is equal to 5, p of x is 243. So 243 is our unknown constant a times 5 minus 2 squared times 5 times 5 plus 4. After computing all of this, that's 405a. Therefore, a is 243 divided by 405, which happens to simplify down to 3 fifths. With a equals 3 fifths, the only possible choice for that constant, we have our only possible polynomial of degree 4 with the given roots at their given multiplicities going through the given point. p of x is 3 fifths times x minus 2 squared times x times x plus 4. In problem 10, we have a polynomial of degree 3, p of x. We're given a root of multiplicity 2 at x equals 1 and a root of multiplicity 1 at x equals minus 1. We're also told the y-intercept is at y equals negative 7 tenths. So can we find a formula for p of x? Much like previous problems, but moving a little faster because we've done it before, we end up with factors x minus 1 to the second power and x plus 1 to the first power. Those match our given roots and multiplicities. Those factors alone, if multiplied together, would determine a polynomial of degree 3. So p of x has no more factors of positive degree, it just has an unknown constant factor. p of x is a constant a times x minus 1 squared times x plus 1. The intercept is how we're going to solve for a. Letting x equals 0, we determine p of x should be negative 7 tenths. Solving for a, we get a is negative 0 0.7. So p of x is negative 7 tenths times x minus 1 squared times x plus 1. In problem 11, we're going to use a graphing utility to find all real solutions to x cubed minus 4x squared minus x plus 10 is equal to 0, and the graph is sort of shown below. You would simply use your calculator or computer software to produce this graph. And there's not really much for us to do in a solution video. It's just using a computer to find the roots, and that's going to depend very much on what calculator or computer software package you're using. The solutions are exactly 2 and 1 plus or minus root 6, which as decimal approximations would be 2 and negative 1.45 and 3.45 roughly, rounded off to two decimal points. Uh, there is a way to find the exact solutions, but we were not asked to do that. In problem 12, solve the inequality x minus 6 times x minus 3 squared is positive. Select all the intervals from the five options given that are included in the solution. So we're going to use what I refer to as the number line method. We put down a number line x minus 6, one of those factors, is a linear function with positive slope. 
So a line with positive slope is negative and then it's zero and then it's positive. And this line happens to be zero at x equals six. So we're gonna mark down x equals six and this factor of x minus six is negative then it's zero, then it's positive. X minus three squared is a parabola that opens up and has vertex at three comma zero. So it will be positive everywhere except at its vertex where it's zero. So we're gonna mark down on the number line x equals uh, three to the left of x equals six. For x minus three squared, we're positive and then zero and then positive everywhere else. Then we can look at the product, just sort of checking where am I negative, positive, etc., and multiplying them together. In the leftmost piece, a negative times a positive is negative. At x equal three, something times zero is zero and so forth. We're just going through at each point marked and each interval marked. And now what we're doing is we're asking, okay, where was that positive? That was the original problem. And it's just right here at the right. At six, the product will be zero, which we don't want to include because our original inequality did not include zero. So we want six and everything to the right. That's just option E, x bigger than six. In problem 13, solve the following inequality and graph its solution. x plus four times x minus two is negative. We're instructed to choose test values to indicate whether the inequality is true or false in each region. So what is meant by region? We're gonna do the number line method again. The two factors, x plus four and x minus two have roots at x equals minus four and x equals two. And these are the only places where this function could possibly change from positive to negative. Overall, we're comparing a function to zero. And that function on the left is going to be a polynomial. It is continuous. It doesn't have any jumps or gaps. So if it's gonna change from positive to negative, it's going to have to cross the axis and have a root. And we know exactly where the roots are. So here, the function is exactly equal to zero. So we have three regions to the left of minus four, in between minus four and two, and to the right of two. On these regions, the function cannot change sign. I don't yet know whether they're positive or negative on these regions, but it cannot change. The only place the function can change sign is where it is equal to zero. So in each region, we're going to pick one point, plug it into the function and see whether we get out something positive or negative. So to the left of minus four, I'm gonna pick x equals minus five. If I plug in x equals minus five, into the function x plus four times x minus two, we end up with positive seven, that's positive. Therefore, the function is positive everywhere to the left of minus four, because on this region, I know it does not change sign, and at one point it is positive, so it must be positive everywhere. In between x equals minus four and x equals two, I elect to pick x equals zero. I plug that in, we get negative eight, that's negative, so the function is negative on this entire region. And finally, to the right of two, I'm just gonna use three, and then the function will evaluate to positive seven, that's positive, so the function is positive everywhere to the right of two. It doesn't really matter what values of x you test as long as they're in the correct regions. So for my left region to the left of minus four, I could have picked negative eight, or negative 321, or even negative 4.01 if I wanted. Anything to the left of negative four would be fine. I'm just sticking to whole numbers as close as possible, and on that middle region, zero seemed like a pretty easy pick. So ultimately we were asked, where is this product negative? It's exactly in between negative four and two. So there is our solution expressed as a compound inequality for X's which are bigger than minus four and less than two, the resulting product will be negative. Problem 14, very similar to other problems we've already done. Solve the following inequality, X minus zero times X plus one is bigger than or equal to zero. Well, we have roots at X equals zero and X equals minus one. So we plot those down on a number line. These are the only places where the function can change sign because they are the only roots of the function. So at these places, x minus zero times x plus one will be zero because one of the two factors will be equal to zero. So on each of the three regions, negative infinity to minus one, minus one to zero, and zero to infinity, the function cannot change sign. We're going to pick a test value in each interval. To the left of minus one, we're gonna pick x equals minus two. Plugging that into x minus zero times x plus one results in positive two. So the function is positive everywhere to the left of minus one. Picking something in between negative one and zero, we're gonna go with negative one half. 
plugging that into our x minus 0 times x plus 1 will ultimately result in negative 1 fourth. That's negative, so the function is negative on that entire interval. And finally, we need to pick a value of x to the right of 0, and 1 is a pretty simple pick. This gives us an end result of 2, which is positive. So the product will be positive for all values of x bigger than 0. Ultimately, we were asked for this product to be bigger than or perhaps equal to 0. So we're looking for x is less than or equal to minus 1, or x is bigger than or equal to 0. In problem 15, solve the polynomial inequality. 2 times x plus 3 squared times x plus 9 times x minus 5 is less than 0, and give the answer in interval notation. Very similar to the last few problems we've done, just with more factors. Okay, we're also going to reduce the number of computations necessary, so we don't have to do eight different test points. We're still going to use the number line method. The factors tell us exactly what the only roots are. The only roots are at x equals minus 3, minus 9, and positive 5. So here's our number line with x equals negative 9, negative 3, and positive 5, and these are places where the function is 0. Now let's look at x equals minus 9. That corresponded to the factor x plus 9 to the first power. Since that factor has odd multiplicity, it's a crossing root. So at x equals minus 9, we know that the sign will change. It is crossing. Similarly, x equals 5 is a crossing root because its corresponding factor had multiplicity 1. But x equals minus 3 corresponds to the factor x plus 3 squared. That's a non-crossing root because it has even multiplicity. So we are going to have the same sign on both sides. So I now know where the function can possibly be 0, only at x equals minus 9, minus 3, and 5, and I know whether or not the sign changes on both sides or doesn't. Now overall, if you were to expand this whole thing out, what would the leading term be? You'd have a 2 times x squared times x times x. You would have 2x to the fourth. You have a positive leading coefficient. So we know the end behavior. Since overall, the function we're looking at would have positive leading coefficient and be a polynomial, if we were to let x fly off to plus infinity, the function would go to plus infinity. It would be positive off to the right. Now I can start working left. x equals 5 was a crossing root, so since it's positive to the right, it must be negative to the left. x equals minus 3 is not a crossing root, so if it's negative on one side, it's negative on the other. x equals minus 9 is a crossing root, so since it's negative on the right, it must be positive on the left. And now, referring back to the original problem, we want our polynomial to be negative. Where is this polynomial negative? From negative 9 to negative 3, and then from negative 3 to 5. Now we need to exclude x equals minus 3, specifically because here the function is 0 and we did not want to include 0 zero in our inequality. So for problem 16, we want to solve the inequality. Negative s cubed is greater than or equal to 10s squared plus 21s and give the answer in interval notation. The technique we've used so far for dealing with polynomial inequalities is to find roots, then stating that those are the only places the function could possibly change sign, but that's only useful if you're comparing something to zero. Changing sign from positive to negative is quite explicitly around the value of zero. So the first thing we need to do in this problem is move everything to one side so that something is being compared to zero. I'm going to move everything to the right just so that all of my coefficients are now positive. And I prefer to write it in this order. s cubed plus 10s squared plus 21 else should be less than or equal to zero. We can factor an s out of that whole thing. Observe, we have s cubed, s squared, and s. Remo factoring an s out of each one leaves behind s squared plus 10s plus 21, which factors pretty directly as s plus 3 times s plus 7. So what have we accomplished so far? Starting from our original inequality, we've determined this is the same thing as s times s plus 3 times s plus 7 should be less than or equal to 0. Now we can put down a number line. We have the three roots of 0, negative 3, and negative 7 respectively. Because they all have multiplicity 1, which is odd, they are crossing roots. These are the only places the polynomial on the left could possibly change sign. Therefore, if we can just determine whether the polynomial is positive or negative on one piece, we could move through and figure out the rest. So we're just going to test s equals 1. It's not a root, so it's in one of our regions. If we let s equal 1, we get 1 times 4 times 8. Whatever it is, it's definitely positive. Now we're going to use the crossing points to complete the number line. So here's our number line. Here are our roots, negative 7, negative 3, and 0. They were all crossing roots. 
having tested s equals one, we got a positive value off on the right. And since they're all crossing, we go from positive to negative to positive to negative. And then overall, we wanted this entire expression to be less than or equal to zero. So we are negative on the left piece. So that's minus infinity all the way up to and including negative seven because zero is included in this problem. But also that little middle piece from negative three to zero, we are negative and zero on those endpoints, which is included. In problem 17, let's find the domain of s of x equals the square root of negative 3x minus x squared. Write it in interval notation. Okay. The only restriction is that the thing under the radical needs to be non-negative. In other words, negative 3x minus x squared needs to be bigger than or equal to 0. Multiplying both sides by minus 1 and putting terms in standard order, x squared plus 3x should be less than or equal to 0. There's an x I can factor out, leaving behind x times x plus 3 should be less than or equal to 0. So we have two crossing roots on the number line. We have negative three is a crossing root and zero is a crossing root. Let's just pick a test value in the rightmost piece. We have x equals one. We're gonna end up with a positive number. So the function is positive on that right piece. And now with crossing roots, it must go from positive to negative and to positive as we move from right to left. We were looking for this expression to be less than or equal to zero. That only happens between negative three and zero, including both endpoints. So there is the domain of our expression, just the numbers from negative three to zero, including both. In problem 18, a bird's weight w is frequently related to the length l of its wingspan. For a particular species of bird, the formula w equals 1.1 times l cubed could be used to predict the bird's weight w in kilogram for a wingspan of l meters. If a bird has a wingspan of 0.5 meters, estimate the weight. So we're going to set the weight to be 0.5. In other words, 0.5 is equal to 1.1 times L cubed. I'm going to convert these into fractions because I like fractions more than decimals. 1 half is 11 tenths times L cubed. Multiplying both sides by 10 over 11, we get 10 over 22 is equal to L cubed. And now I can just take a cube root. L is 10 over 22 to the 1 third. We were instructed to round our answer to the nearest hundredth, so charging through a calculator, this is about 0.77 meters. Part B, if the wingspan of a bird doubles, what happens to its weight? In other words, suppose we have to compute the weight for a given length. This would be the wingspan for a corresponding length, but then I need to compare it to the wingspan for twice the length. In other words, we should plug in 2L instead of L. So what's the wingspan for 2L? Well, it would be 1.1 times 2L cubed. That power of three distributes across and you get two cubed times L cubed. I can move around some things and I get eight, that's two cubed, times 1.1L cubed. But remember, 1.1L cubed is exactly the wingspan for a corresponding length L. So the wingspan of 2L is eight times the wingspan of L. If you double the wingspan of the bird, its weight will probably increase by a factor of eight. 